This week in IT, is Microsoft really killing off Patch Tuesday for some of its enterprise customers? The remote help feature that it announced a few weeks ago is now generally available. The Windows 10 November 2021 update is now available for broad deployments. Microsoft is planning to disable the server message block protocol version 1 in Windows 11. On-premises exchange server cumulative updates are going biannual. And I've got a hot tip for you how you can use the calendar and task list in Outlook to block out time so that you can get stuff done. And I'm also going to be highlighting some really new interesting how-tos on the Petri IT knowledge base. First this week, I want to go back to some news that about a future Microsoft announce called Windows Auto Patch a couple of weeks ago. Now, at first, this uh, new service didn't really seem to be that interesting, partly because it's only going to be available to, I think, those enterprises that have an enterprise E3 license for their Windows clients. But basically what it is, is you can think of it like Windows Update for Business, where you can manually set up different deployment rings and then decide when you're going to deploy Windows updates as they're released on Patch Tuesday to those rings. Now that's something that your IT department has to set up for itself and has to manage for itself. And while it's probably a better option these days than Windows Update, the Windows Server Update service, at least that's built into Windows Server, of course, it does require quite a lot of effort in terms of testing, setup and management for your IT department. Now, the idea of Windows Auto Patch is to basically take the setup and management responsibility away from your in-house IT and let Microsoft do all the hard work and kind of become your update team, if you like. So what this does, this service, is it automatically sets up four rings for you. So a test ring, first, fast, and broad. So in the test ring, you'd have the minimum number of devices just to make sure that you know all the configurations that you have across your organization are compatible with these patches. Then you'd gradually push out these patches and test the updates with more and more devices. And Microsoft will manage that whole process for you. And when it gets data that, yes, everything's going OK in, let's say, the test ring, it will then trigger deployment in the first ring, then expand the deployment as it understands from telemetry data that everything's going OK to the fast and to the broad rings. Now, there are a couple of interesting things about this service. So the first, of course, is only going to be available to those that are paying for an E3 enterprise license for Windows. So that's interesting. And so it's really you no, know, it's the kind of thing that's a little bit annoying, really, because this is something, of course, that would really benefit smaller companies that don't really have the in-house skills or resources to deploy something successfully, like Windows Update for Business, for example, where you would have to do all of this manually. And the other thing about this is that there have been some headlines that Microsoft is killing off Patch Tuesday for some organizations, that Microsoft is just going to push out updates, you know, regardless of, you know, whether they've been properly tested or not before Patch Tuesday. Now, I'm not really sure whether that's true or not, but it's interesting with this service because it might help Microsoft to actually test these updates across a wider set of devices in enterprises, get some data on how well they're received on the devices, you know, do they cause them to crash or any kind of compatibility issues. And then, of course, use that information when it does come to Patch Tuesday to understand, well, are these patches already, you know, uh, in a good state to push out to as many devices as possible? So I think it probably helps, you know, organizations that have access to this feature and Microsoft as well, potentially, to improve the reliability of their updates. Because when I first read that Microsoft is killing off Patch Tuesday for some organizations, so for organizations that are, of course, going to use this Windows update feature, I thought, well, what could possibly go wrong with that? But maybe, you know, it's not all quite as it seems.
While I'm on the subject of some of the announcements that were made a couple of weeks ago, I'd also like to quickly talk about the remote help feature that caused a bit of a stir. Now, this is basically a quick assist, which is already built into Windows 10 and Windows 11 on steroids. And basically, this kind of better integrates with Active Directory, gives you some more security features. And, you know, it's a little bit you know, of a step up from quick assist. And it's, I suppose it's designed to compete with TeamViewer, things like that. But it's pretty pricey. So Microsoft has actually released it uh, into general availability, I think, today or this week. And so it's come around a bit sooner than we expected. And now we can confirm the pricing. So it was suspected that it would be $3.50 per user, which is you know, pretty pricey. But not only do you have to license each user, you also have to license each admin. So I'm I'm just going to leave that there, you know, whether this was something that would work for you or not, you know, you're going to have to do the math yourself. In other news this week, Windows 10, uh, the November 2021 update, is now ready for broad deployment. So what that basically means is that Microsoft believes this is now stable enough for enterprises to roll it out in their organizations. And of course, that is what Microsoft recommends that you do. So of course, it's well, you know, getting on for six months since that update was released. And that's pretty much normal. Microsoft usually waits that kind of time to make sure that the build is stable for its enterprise customers. This is a little bit confusing news this week. Apparently, Microsoft is getting ready to disable the server message block protocol, so that's SMB version 1, in Windows 11. And apparently, that's already now the case in all Windows 11 Insider builds. So if you do a clean install, it's not going to be uh, enabled by default. Now, I thought that was the case in Windows 10 already for many years, so I don't really quite understand what's happening with Windows 11, why this is different in Windows 11. From the, from the outset seems a bit odd to me, unless there's something that I've misunderstood about this story. And Microsoft says it's also going to, in the future, look at removing that code completely from Windows 11 and whatever the latest version of Windows Server will be at that time, I guess. Um, for customers that still need SMB version 1, they will have the option to install an out-of-band update to get that functionality back, uh, but it will be unsupported by Microsoft. So of course some customers who are maybe connecting to very old NAS devices that don't support newer versions of the server message block protocol, which is the protocol that Windows uses to connect to file servers across the network. I'm just going to mention this in passing for customers that are still using Exchange Server on premises. Microsoft is moving to a biannual release for cumulative updates for Exchange Server. So that might affect you if you've still got Exchange Server in your own data center or you're running a hybrid cloud on premises Exchange Server network. In this week's hot tip, I want to show you how you can use the calendar and to do tasks in Outlook to block out time to complete stuff that you need to get done uh, during the working week. So let's head over to Outlook on the web and I'll show you how that works. So here you can see that I've got my calendar in Outlook, I've got my morning editorial meeting, and I've got my, of course, all important lunch break scheduled. So if you come over to the top right corner here and enable the My Day pane, you've got two options, either to view your calendar, which of course maybe is not very useful when you're actually in calendar mode, but you've also got the option to view the to-do list. Now I've got an important task here to record this video uh, next week, so I want to block out some time to actually do that. So all I have to do is to click on it and to drag it onto my calendar. So I'm going to bring it across to Wednesday at four o'clock and sorry, Wednesday at half past three. And I'm going to extend the time it takes to record that until five o'clock. And it's really as simple as that. It's really useful for making sure that you get stuff done and not just have a, a huge task list of things that never actually gets completed. 
And this week, I also want to highlight a couple of articles on Petri, so maybe this will be a feature that we do every week. There are a couple of how-to articles that I think are really interesting. Now, Flo Fox has written another amazing article on Microsoft Azure. I don't know if you've ever read his articles, but they go so you know, insanely deep. Uh, I think, you know, you'd have to pay a consultant, you know, some good money to really get the advice you you uh, can get in these articles. And this month, he's written an article for us on how to connect to Microsoft 365 uh, using Azure Express Route and uh, an Azure Virtual WAN. Now, I've you know read through this, and I know quite a bit about all of these things, but it really is quite something to behold the level of detail he goes into if this is something you need to do. So you've got all of the information that you need here, lots of you know really great graphics to explain how all of this works and interestingly lots of information about the pitfalls and the kinds of configurations that you should avoid, what's going to work and what's not going to work. So that's a really great article there from Flo. Uh, he's uh, brought us another great one this month. So going back, there's another great article this week and something that I've had to do in PowerShell in the past from M Michael Reinders, how to download a file using PowerShell. So basically how to automate the process of downloading a file. Now, of course, there are various ways of doing this. Uh, you can maybe copy a file across the local network uh, using the copy item command. But maybe what's even more interesting and maybe not quite so obvious how to do is to use the invoke web request command to download files from the internet. Now, Michael's gone into lots of details here, not just how to download a file, how to automate it from the command line, but also how to download files and to automatically extract files from a zip if you need to do that as well. So another great practical article there on how you can automate things that you, know, you might need to be doing as part of a, a, maybe an admin process or just something that you need to automate in your organization. If you'd like to see more of these kind of news roundups and tips, then please subscribe to the channel and don't forget to like the video. It really helps us to get the video seen by more people.